You know, I want to I wanna start this episode off by explaining what a generational curse is, right? Now, a generational curse or hereditary curse is a particular type of supernatural curse that is passed from parent to offspring, usually until the entire family line die out or unless they find some way to break the curse. Usually, it was specifically placed upon a family by someone else, but sometimes it can be the result of karma received or black magic performed by an originating member of the family. In some cases, it can even be the price paid for making a particular vow. Now, there are some families that come to mind when I think about that term, like the Kennedys, you know the Kennedys was cursed, um, the Shakurs, Tupac and the family, and the Rockefellers, and, and many more, right? But what about the family of Malcolm X? Civil rights leader Malcolm X, who was gunned down in front of everybody back in the 60s. And before him, his father, Earl Little, back in 1931, you know, Earl Little, he was a black Baptist preacher from Georgia who, who worked with uh, Jamaican, uh, Jamaican political activist Marcus Garvey. He was beat up and found killed across the train tracks with his body almost split in half by the KKK when Malcolm X was like six years old. But another, but another member of Malcolm X's family, right? His grandson, Malcolm Shabazz, who was following in the footsteps of his grandfather and great-grandfather and becoming a leader for the young people. You know, he had a, he had a rough childhood early on, but when he got it together and realized who he was, he was getting ready to be something special. Let's get into his story right now. Now, Malcolm Latif Shabazz was born October 8th, 1984 in Paris, France. Now, his mother, Kubila Shabazz, was the second daughter of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz, six daughters. And his father was an Algerian Muslim who Malcolm claimed he never met or had anything to do with. Now, growing up, he had a rough childhood because his family sheltered him because he was the first male descendant of his grandfather, Malcolm X. And Malcolm X always wanted a son. After his mother left Paris, France, they came back to the United States and him and his mom, they moved around a lot, bouncing from place to place, from Philadelphia to California, New York, Minnesota, Texas, Florida, and a bunch of different places. I mean, it was rough for him and his mother, Kubila. When they were in California, she used to drink a lot and, and she worked a lot of jobs. Plus, she was dealing with mental illness, which left Malcolm wandering the streets all by himself at a very young age, like three or four years old. And that made him an angry kid. Like, like, for example, right, one time he set his shoes on fire just for attention. But in his mother's defense, Kubila, she, she been through a lot. I mean, the whole family, man. His mother, alongside her sisters, were actually there at the Audubon Ballroom in 1965. And they seen their father, Malcolm X, shot and killed. I think Kubila was like four years old at the time. And seeing something like that, it could mess you up for life. Now, after California, they ended up moving to Philly with his great-grandmother, Madeline Sandlin, who was a Native American and, and the stepmother of his grandmother, Betty Shabazz. And when he was in Philly, they put him in private school because the neighborhood was so rough, he couldn't even go outside to play. Now, when Malcolm was in kindergarten at a private school, he went to school with a lot of rich white kids who used to call him the N-word all the time. 
and being around all those white kids made him want to be white because to him it seemed like they had a good life and black people didn't by second grade he ended up living in New York with his white teacher and things were going good I mean he had pet animals a bike went to church every Sunday and was the only black kid in the school and he had a lot of friends but one day one of his aunts came to pick him up for the summer and didn't really like the situation of him living with his white teacher and never brought him back now once he started living with his aunt by third grade he began to act out and ended up getting in trouble in school because he brought a knife to class by the age of nine years old his grades continued to slip but the crazy part is he was very intelligent he was smart he was a bookworm i mean he had that malcolm x blood in him and it was just school wasn't enough challenge for him which led to him getting into more trouble that's when he started hanging around the drug dealers and the gangbangers on the corners looking up to them as male role models because see he was raised by a family of all women and they worked a lot though and they always were leaving him by himself most of the time and he just wanted some attention like like one incident he stole his aunt's car and drove her to school the crazy part is right after that his mother put him in a mental institution because of his behavior now after that incident he ended up moving back with his mother who was now living in Minnesota living in a hotel with her new boyfriend a guy named Michael Fitzpatrick who Malcolm looked up to and even called him dad now see Kubila Shabazz was telling Michael Fitzpatrick about trying to hire a hitman to kill the minister Louis Farrakhan because for years her mother Betty Shabazz told them that the nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan played a role in Malcolm X's murder but come to find out Michael Fitzpatrick was an FBI informant and set her up for the murder plot against Louis Farrakhan the whole time she was plotting to kill Farrakhan she was being set up and didn't know cameras were in the hotel room her phone lines were tapped and she was being followed and watched and in 1995 she was indicted on charges for trying to hire Michael Fitzpatrick to kill Farrakhan facing 90 years in prison and fines over two million dollars but see Farrakhan he, he spoke up for her and, and defended her and him and Betty Shabazz shook hands on stage at the Apollo Theater at a fundraiser event for Kubila Legal Defense and they say uh, Betty Shabazz she only squashed her uh, beef and the issues with Farrakhan to help her daughter who she believes was framed the charges were later dropped and Kubila accepted a plea agreement that required her to undergo psychological counseling and treatment for drug and alcohol abuse. Now, Dick Gregory, rest in peace Dick Gregory, right? He was close to the Shabazz family and said, after Kubila admitted to her crime, the government had her under mind control. Hmm. Now, now see, while all that was going on, right, Malcolm ended up being sent to a group home and later on went to live with a foster family that was ready to adopt him. But once they found out who his family was and, and what his mother had, had done, they, they decided not to do it. Now, after that, he ended up going to school in Connecticut but got in some trouble there. Then he went back to Philly and got in some more trouble and that's when he was once again reunited with his mother who was now living in San Antonio, Texas now. When he got back with his mom, she had a new boyfriend and everything was going good. Everything was, everything was good. He was in another private school and 
They were living in a Mexican neighborhood. They had a jacuzzi and they had money and everything. But see, his mother's boyfriend ended up getting locked up for attempted murder. And that's when things began to go downhill, which made his mother started drinking heavy again. And her and Malcolm started arguing and fighting a lot again because she wouldn't take him to school. And he started getting behind in his classes and eventually he ended up getting kicked out. And all that fighting between him and his mother led to him being put in a mental hospital again for about two weeks. Now, after that, he was sent to New York this time to live with his grandmother, Betty Shabazz. But he continued to lash out because he wanted to be with his mother. But see, Betty Shabazz was doing everything she could to help him. She would take him with her when she was speaking at colleges, going overseas, doing everything, right? And But he just wanted to be with his mom, and he just couldn't understand why he couldn't be with her. So in his mind, he thought if he acted up and do bad things, they would send him back. And that's when he started stealing cars, running away from home, and stealing money from his aunts to try to buy a ticket to go back to Texas. And on June 1st, 1997, at 12 years old, Malcolm thought if he set a fire in front of his room door, they would send him back with his mom. But he didn't he didn't think the whole thing through because his grandmother, Betty Shabazz, ran through the fire to try to save him because she thought the house was being firebombed because she she had been through all that before back with her husband Malcolm X back in the 60s and she was just trying to save her grandson and ended up with 90% of her body being burned after several operations in the hospital three weeks later she died from her third degree burn injuries she was 63 years old. Now, when the cops found Malcolm, he was walking the streets barefoot with no shoes on and gasoline all over him. And in court, a mental health specialist at his trial described him as a schizophrenic boy of a paranoid type. While another specialist tried to say he was fascinated by fire all because he set his shoes on fire at age of three. I mean, the crazy part is, like I said, Dick Gregory was close to the family. And in an interview that's on YouTube, he said, the truth is four guys in hoods came to the apartment that night and made Malcolm tell the story that he caused the fire. Hmm. He also said a couple other things in that interview about when Betty Shabazz was in the hospital and, and the doctors is, is crazy. Y'all gotta check the interview out. Now, but Malcolm, he, he pled guilty and was sentenced to 18 months in juvenile detention for manslaughter and arson. And he remained in state custody for almost four years. Now, while in juvie, he became a blood gang member and would sneak out to go sell drugs and do all types of crazy stuff. And in 2001, he was released and was trying to change his life. So he enrolled in John Jay College of Criminal Justice studying criminology. But check this, his PO was jealous of him because he went to that same school and, and felt some kind of way and had him locked back up for violating his curfew for being one hour late. In 2002, he was arrested again in New York on robbery and burglary charges, but now he was an adult. Well, he was 17 and he was sentenced to three years in prison. But check this out now. The real story behind that whole thing was he was actually trying to protect a 12 year old girl who was about to be raped by some gang member drug dealer guy. And he ended up beating the guy up pretty bad to the point. He was in the hospital. When it came time for court, they didn't let the 12 year old girl testify because she was underage. So it just looked like he was the bad guy in the whole situation and he had to take a plea. 
Now, in prison, once everybody knew he was the grandson of Malcolm X, they showed him nothing but love because most of the inmates read the book of Malcolm X and were Muslims. And, and Malcolm would study Islam just like his grandfather, Malcolm X, did when he was in prison. It was like Malcolm X being born again through him. He had the power and he was bringing a lot of unity and love amongst the inmates. But see, the staff and the officers looked at him as a threat with a lot of power and would beat him up and they would do things like tamper with his mail, set him up claiming he got razors and weapons all because of his family's name and legacy. Now, Malcolm also said he spent a lot of time in his cell talking to his dead grandmother, Betty Shabazz, asking for a sign that she forgave him and just wanted her to know he was sorry and wanted to know if she accepted his apology because he didn't mean to do that to her. But he said he would get no response and he really wanted that response from her. Once he got out of prison, he wanted to change his life. But in 2006, he was arrested for punching and breaking the window of a Yonkers donut shop. After that incident, he really knew he had to change his ways and get his life together. And that's when he went to the Middle East to do some studying and would do speaking engagements and seminars around the world talking to the young people. He wanted to be more like his grandfather, Malcolm X, and speak on social justice, prison, police brutality. He spoke on the killing of Trayvon Martin in Florida. He was uniting gangs to come together and everything. And I mean, he was getting with the hip hop community too. He was even cool with Libyan leader uh, Gaddafi, who America thought of as an enemy and hated. And y'all seen what they did to him. But Malcolm looked at uh, Muammar Gaddafi like a like a father figure. When I do that Gaddafi story, it's, it's, it's going to blow your mind. But anyway, around that time, right, that's when he found out he was being watched by the government. And they had him under investigation and he started calling them out. In February 2013... He was arrested by the FBI while en route to Iran to attend and speak at a, a Hollywoodism conference. But on May 9th, 2013, Malcolm Shabazz was killed in Mexico City. Now, there were a lot of stories about how he died. Now, I heard some reports say he was thrown off of a roof. He was thrown out of a window. Uh, the CIA killed him, but the main one is they say he went to Mexico to meet with a friend who was an immigration labor activist who had been deported. Around 3 a.m., him and his friend met some girls in a rough part of the town, who were and these girls were known to set up and scam out of towners. They had um, they had gone to the bar that was in a rough area and ran up a bill to $1,200. After arguing with the waiters about the bill, they started fighting and the waiters jumped them and beat them with a blunt object, probably a, a pipe or a baseball bat, they say. They beat them so bad that it left Malcolm with a broken skull, broken jaw, and rib fractures. His friend that was with him was robbed, but he managed to escape and run to go get help. Now, some of the people and witnesses that was there said Malcolm was alive when the ambulance came and took him away. Hmm. They ended up catching the two guys. They, was, uh, they were arrested and convicted and sentenced to like 30 years in prison. After his death, though, man, the Afro-Mexicans in that area, they started protesting his murder, saying... There's a sense that if Malcolm X's grandson can be lynched here, none of them were safe because in Mexico, Afro-Mexicans are not counted as a distinct ethnic group and they face severe racial discrimination and social economic disparities. And a couple years before that happened, now see a couple years before Malcolm was killed, 
a black Mexican guy was brutally murdered in which many believe it was a racial killing done by the police. Now, some people also say that Malcolm was assassinated like his grandfather Malcolm X because he spoke the truth and they, didn't, they don't want another Malcolm X out here, point blank period. Minister Louis Farrakhan claimed the government had something to do with it, the same as his grandfather Malcolm X. And you know, I know, I know Malcolm had a couple books he was working on and he was getting ready to release them, but one of his friends said the book, his emails and everything all disappeared. I know his aunt Ilyasa Shabazz, his favorite aunt and who he named his daughter after, um, she put out some good books on her father, Malcolm X, too. Y'all definitely can check out. And I hope she do a book on her nephew. That'd be dope. If Ilyasa uh, Shabazz do a book on Malcolm, that'd be dope. Because there's just so... There's so much information to this story that we need to know what really happened. He was 28 years old. R.I.P. Malcolm Shabazz.